Good morning, Grace Baptist Church. I hope that you are having a wonderful morning and enjoying the winter wonderland outside that we have been blessed to see over the past few days and i hope that you have been safe and enjoying and if you had to be out and about in it um that you have uh, enjoyed the beauty but been safe on the roads um i was out yesterday and um, driving around and doing some important things like um, running errands and going to dunkin donuts um and uh was mindful of how um the our roads were the road main roads were um great um but i had to go to warsaw so i had to cross the bridge in order to do so and i was reminded of uh signs that i used to see in certain places that i've lived over the years that you you've probably seen them as well um next to bridges that say that say things like bridge freezes before roadway and so the roadway could be fine but the bridge might be uh, entirely frozen and um and you you know you don't know till you till you get on it which is kind of intimidating um and you don't you know but you don't really have any choices at that point you unless you stop in the middle of the road um, get out and abandon your vehicle or turn around in traffic and go the other direction um, you've got to cross that bridge and get, get to the other side and bridges are great for that that's what they're designed to do to get us from one place to another uh, when we wouldn't otherwise be able to, to to do that and I think that what we're going to see in this morning's message is the fact the the means of a, a bridge that God has given us between uh, who who and how he wants us to be and what he wants us to do and sometimes that bridge like um, like a bridge in bad weather can get tricky and even treacherous to cross because not uh, not because of the weather obviously but because of our internal circumstances and conditions Primarily our selfishness. Uh, it can get in the way of us crossing, making that crossing smoothly because uh, we will want to put our own conditions on God's will and what he wants us to do. And we'll put our own will and desires ahead of his. And even in the doing of his will, uh, we will try to gain our, uh, our will in the midst of that. You'll see what I'm talking about as we go through this morning's passage, but um, as we get ready to do that, if you would join me in prayer, because what we're going to do is ask God to help us cross that bridge today between who he wants us to be, how he wants us to be, and what he wants us to do, and to do so safely, successfully, and for his glory and the advancement of his kingdom. Would you join me in prayer, please? And we thank you for the opportunity to be in your word this morning and we thank you that you have given us your word as instruction as your truth as the means by which we can see uh, the bridges that you'd have us cross from one place in our life uh, to another um, from and to do so um, by your grace and with your help. Um, This morning, all of us need your help to be who you want us to be and to do what you want us to do. And some of us, um, all of us, in fact, struggle with um, crossing that bridge sometimes, um, thinking that we are who you want us to be and, um, and that we must be doing what you want us to do when, in fact, there's a bridge that you want us to cross yet Um, to get uh, over everything that's in the way and to your will uh, for our lives and for your church. So please guide us there, get us there, uh, deliver us from everything that hinders us from getting there this morning by your grace and for your glory. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's uh, take a step back to last week when we were talking about um, what God wants us to be and and for a little bit we talked about what he wants us uh, to do 
So if you look back at Luke chapter 14, uh, starting with verse 1, we're gonna, we'll read those, the, this passage again together, verses 1 through 14. And God's word says this. Now it happened as he went into the house of one of the rulers of the Pharisees. This is Jesus, uh, of course, going into the house of one of the rulers of the Pharisees to eat bread on the Sabbath, that they watched him closely. And behold, there was a certain man before him who had dropsy. And Jesus answering spoke to the lawyers and Pharisees saying, is it lawful to heal on the Sabbath? But they kept silent, and he took him and healed him and let him go. Then he answered them, saying, Which of you, having a donkey or an ox that has fallen into a pit, will not immediately pull him up, pull him out on the Sabbath day? And they could not answer him regarding these things. So he told a parable to those who were invited when he noted how they chose the best places, saying to them, when you are invited to anyone by anyone to a wedding feast, do not sit down in the best place, lest one more honorable than you be invited by him. And he who invited you and him come and say to you, Give place to this man. And then you begin with shame to take the lowest place. But when you are invited, go and sit down in the lowest place, so that when he who invited you comes, he may say to you, Friend, go up higher. And then you will have glory in the presence of those who sit at the table with you. For whoever exalts himself will be humbled, and he who humbles himself will be exalted. And that's kind of our linchpin verse for this passage as far as what God wants us to be. Uh, one of the things, one of the major things he wants us to be, and that is humble. So we talked about the fact that God wants us to love to be uh, lowly or humble. Um, so and it goes on in verses uh, 12 through 14 to say this. Then he also said to him who invited him, when you give a dinner or a supper, do not ask your friends, your brothers, your relatives, nor rich neighbors, lest they also invite you back and you be repaid. But when you give a feast, invite the poor, the maimed, the lame, the blind, and you will be blessed because they cannot repay you. For you shall be repaid at the resurrection of the just. So what we entitled or what we titled last uh, week's sermon was intend to depend and descend to descend from our lofty um, opinions of ourselves, whether that is uh, materially speaking whether that is um, spiritually speaking, whatever it is, however it is that we see ourselves better um, than others and someone else, and to lo to be lowly, to be humble in the face of God and other people so that we can love to be lowly and then we can look for the lowly as Jesus was talking about the examples of those in those last three verses in the passage that we just read. He mentioned them as the poor, the mean, the lame, the blind, examples of all of the kinds of people that the Pharisees would have refused to reach out to because they saw them as unfit um, for their presence. And what we're going to see this morning is that we started to cross that bridge from what God wants us to be, which is lowly and humble, surrendered to him, submissive before him and others. His word is... Uh, replete with verses about that uh, heart condition that he desires for us, that attitude that he wants us to have of uh, being submissive to uh, him and to one another. And then we started to cross that bridge and we're going to tend to cross that bridge this morning and we're going to deal with um, some of the things that um, might hinder our crossing and get them out of the way. So if you're looking at the PowerPoint that I sent you along with this message, you'll see that after these verses from Luke chapter 14, there's one from Romans chapter 12, and it's verse 16, and it says this, Be of the same mind toward one another. Do not set your mind on high things, but associate with the humble. 
Do not be wise in your own opinion. This is a really important verse and some really important truth in it for helping us get across this bridge from who God wants us to be and what he wants us to do. Because, the, in fact, the two things go hand in hand, should go hand in hand. When we are who God wants us to be, we ought to be running across the bridge to what he wants us to do. But what that means is that we need a, a strong reminder and a, and a um, sincere conviction about the fact that we need to be of the same mind toward one another, to not set our mind on high things. In other words, not to be so lofty that we um, think of think ourselves better than than everyone else, and associate with the humble, with those that otherwise might be uh, materially, spiritually, so, uh, societally rejected. And then it says something extremely important, and that is, do not be wise in your own opinion. Do not be wise in your own opinion. And this is one of the things that um, will help us tremendously in crossing the bridge between what God wants us to do, what God wants us to be, or who God wants us to be, and what he wants us to do. Because it doesn't matter um, what uh, obstacles are in the way, what ice is on the ground, whatever else. The If we are willing to not be wise in our own opinion, and instead, as, as Scripture says, to lean on, um, to not lean on our own understanding, but to, in all things, acknowledge God, um, then we can, we can get over, get through, get past... Um, circumvent anything that's in our way that would in particular our selfishness that would keep us from serving God like he wants us to and that's what we see as we continue to read Luke chapter 14 if you look in again in your PowerPoint we'll see um, that uh, Jesus continues to tell them a story that points out the importance of their um, their transformation transformation into who he wants them to be and what he wants them to do. And so in verse 15, it says this, Now when one of those who sat at the table with him heard these things, he said to him, Blessed is he who shall eat bread in the kingdom of God. Then he said to him, then Jesus said to him, A certain man gave a great supper and invited many, and sent his su- servant at supper time to say to those who were invited, Come, for all things are now ready. But they all with one accord began to make excuses. The first said to him, I have bought a piece of ground, and I must go and see it. I ask you to have me excused. And another said, I have bought five yoke of oxen, and I am going to test them. I ask you to have me excused. Still another said, I have married a wife. And therefore I cannot come. So that servant came and reported these things to his master. Then the master of the house, being angry, said to his servant, Go out quickly into the streets and lanes of the city, and bring in here the poor, and the maimed, and the lame, and the blind. And the servant said, Master, it is done as you commanded, and still there is room. And the master said to the servant, Go out into the highways and hedges, and compel them to come in that my house may be filled. For I say to you that none of those men who were invited shall taste my supper. And so what we're going to see in that the that part of Luke chapter 14 this morning are two ways to joyfully prepare for supper with Jesus. Two ways to joyfully prepare for supper with Jesus, or in other words, two ways to joyfully take part in the kingdom of God. Two ways to joyfully take part in the kingdom of God. And the first one of those we're going to see is that God wants you to be reachable. God wants you to be 
reachable. And we find that truth in the in the first uh, six or seven verses, um, first six verses of the passage, starting with verse 15. Again, um, God's word tells us that now when one of those who sat at the table with him, with Jesus, heard these things, he said to him, Blessed is he who shall eat bread in the kingdom of God. <coughs> Excuse me. And he said to him, and then he said to him, then Jesus said to him, a certain man gave a great supper and invited many. Now we know Jesus was a southerner because he, he uses the proper um, noun supper there. I'm just joking with you. Um, refer to my message of, I believe, last week or the, the, the supper dinner debate. Um, and so Jesus says, a certain man gave a supper and invited many. And sent his servant at supper time to say to those who were invited, Come, for all things are now ready. Most likely, um, this was the follow up invitation to the initial invitation, which was customary back then for a formal dinner. Um, so these folks were already aware of the dinner that was to be. And this was the follow up invitation to, invitation to let them know that the things were ready and ready for them. Um, but verse 18 tells us that they all with one accord begin to make excuses. And the verse said to them, I have bought a piece of ground and I must go and see it. I ask you to have me excused. And another said, I have bought five yoke of oxen and I'm going to test them. I ask you to have me excused. Still another said, I have married a wife and therefore I cannot come. Now these are all what... <clears throat> obviously that God saw and we're going to refer to as inexcusable excuses, inexcusable excuses, because none of them were legitimate reasons for refusing the invitation of the, um, the, the, the party host, the dinner host here. And just so that you get the picture um, of what's happening in this parable, is that the dinner host is representative of God and the people who refuse the invitation are representative of the children of Israel who have been invited to um, God for centuries upon centuries and promised the Messiah and now that he was here in Jesus they were rejecting him. Uh, so many of them, many were not, but many of them, especially those that he was having dinner, especially those that were the ilk of um, the ones that he was having dinner with there, like the Pharisees and such, were rejecting him. And they had their excuses as well. And so Jesus is pointing out to them these excuses that sound on the face of them legitimate until you look just a little bit under the surface. For instance... The first guy says, I bought a piece of ground and I must go and see it. I ask you to have me excused. Well, you understand that if someone has a, a piece of property, that that's a big responsibility and they want to tend to that. But that's not what he says. He says, I have bought a piece of ground and I want to go and to see it. And the reason that that is obviously a fabricated excuse is because nobody back then or now, well, maybe now you can, you know, you might be brave enough to buy a piece of land on the internet. If you, um, uh, if you really want to roll that way. I remember when I was a teenager and they were advertising 40 acre plots on television, 40 acre plots in Wyoming. Um, and they were pretty much, you know, sight unseen other than they might, you know, send you a picture of it or something. But, um, I think, you know, they were sending, they were running these commercials in places, you know, highly congested areas and people that see those pictures and they think, my goodness, look at that wide open space. Um, I'm sure I'll pay, you know, however many thousands of dollars for that and take my chances and see if I can, you know, get out there one day. Um, but typically that's not what happens. Usually if you're going to buy a piece of land, you're going to look at it first and um, so this fellow was saying, I, oh, no, I bought a piece of land, now I got to go look at it. And, and obviously, um, something was fishy there. Same with the second person who says, um, I have bought five yoke of oxen and I'm going to test them. 
back then in particular, um, and even in now, um, you wouldn't buy work animals um, if you didn't test them out first. Just make sure that they are going to be able to um, carry the load, pull the um, uh, the yoke, the you know, do the work that you were um, acquiring them for. And yet he goes, says that he he's bought them and now needs to go test them out. So his excuse is um, kind of unfolding right there in in front of um, everyone who's hearing. And there's a point to that. Um, and finally the in verse 20 the last guy has um, almost what sounds like a legitimate excuse it says i have married a wife and therefore i cannot come now you know you start to make assumptions there about about this fellow's wife maybe she just was not maybe she was antisocial and you know um didn't want him to be going to the dinner or either one of them um, things like that um and there was a really important law in the Old Testament, in the book of Deuteronomy, that um, prohibited someone who had been married from going from being com- having to be com- committed to battle, to war, to the army for the first year of marriage, um, and for you know obvious reasons, so that they're so that their marriage and possibly their family could be, um, the foundations could be formed. And so, however, it had no bearing upon their social activity, that, 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 that law and um, provision. So his excuse about I married a wife and therefore I cannot come um, might have tricked somebody who knew that there were some laws that provided excuse or um provision for those who were newly married um but when but for those that were sitting there at that table who knew the law very well they knew good and well that all three of these people were trying to be shady and find their own way around according to their own understanding and their own their own will their own um, personal opinions and interpretations of God and his truth in order to do what they wanted to do instead of what God wanted them to do, which was, in fact, to believe in Jesus. And that was the case for many of the Israelites um, back then. Uh, It's still the case for many lost people today who hear the truth about Jesus and find... um, every excuse that um, you can imagine to not receive him, not to accept him. And uh, we, we, you've probably had that experience if you've talked to someone about Christ and they've given you some of the reasons that make incredible sense to them. But to you, it's like, why in the world is that keeping you away uh, from believing in Jesus? But you have to understand that it's the, it's the, selfish and even satanic deception that tricks people into justifying their just their unbelief in god and their um, rejection of obedience to him and i um there's a passage in hebrews chapter 3 that actually talks about the israelites and um both the both ancient ones who came out of Egypt with Moses and their rejection of God and then a warning here to other Hebrews who are hearing about Jesus and were uh, rejecting him and so I'm just going to read that to you it's in your PowerPoint and we'll see what this kind of attitude looks like in scripture and so it says in Hebrews chapter 3 therefore as the Holy Spirit says today if you will hear his voice do not harden your hearts as in the rebellion, in a day of trial in the wilderness, when your fathers tested me, tried me, and saw my works forty years. Therefore I was angry with that generation. Kind of sounds like the party host, doesn't he? He became angry. This same person here. 
It's God. I became, I was angry with that generation and said, they always go astray in their heart and they have not known my ways. So I swore in my wrath, they shall not enter my rest. Beware, brethren, lest there be any in any of you an evil heart of unbelief in departing from the living God. But exhort one another daily while it is called today, lest any of you be hardened through the deceitfulness of sin. For we have become partakers of Christ if we hold the beginning of our confidence steadfast at the end. While it is said today, if you will hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as in the rebellion. For who, having heard, rebelled? Indeed, was it not all who came out of Egypt, led by Moses? Now with whom was he angry forty years? Was it not with them, who, with those who sinned, whose corpses fell in the wilderness? And to whom did he swear that they would not enter his rest, but to those who did not obey? So we see that they could not enter in because of unbelief. So this points us to the heart condition. Um, Verse 13 says, Today, lest any of you be heartened through the deceitfulness of sin. And that's what's going on here. The excuses made by the people in Jesus' parable were, were just that. They were deceitfulness. They were deceiving themselves and trying to deceive the one who came to find them for the for the supper. And they thought that by doing so, they um, were could convince themselves well enough of their unbelief and their disobedience. And... People still do that today. Maybe maybe you're still doing that today. Maybe you have heard about Jesus Christ and the fact that he is God and that he left heaven and that he came to earth and that he died on the cross to pay for everything you've done wrong so that you do not have to be condemned, ashamed, uh, afraid, but you can be forgiven and be a child of God now and forever. Jesus did that for you. And he was buried and rose again on the third day and now and, and ascended back to heaven where he ru- rules over all things uh, as your Lord and your forgiver and friend. And he wants you to believe him for that and to obey him in what, what he instructs you to do. And he does not want you to be given to your excuses of unbelief your inexcusable excuses because they're based in unbelief and deceit. And he wants that, uh, he wanted that for the Israelites. He wants wants that for sinners um, now that, that haven't truly given their hearts to him. Maybe that's you. And he wants that for you If you are a believer and yet you are uh, rejecting Christ in some other fashion uh, and on on similar grounds as those who were um, excusing themselves from Christ's invitation to the the supper. Uh, You see, I would like to tell you that this attitude of selfish deceit um, ends completely and goes away completely when you are saved when you become a christian but it's something that resides in our flesh and is that we have to be um that we have to grow out of and and be transformed from and it is something that makes our crossing the bridge from who god wants us to be and what he wants us to do quite challenging and even treacherous at times because we deceive ourselves into thinking, uh, to, to being convinced um, by ourselves, from ourselves, according to our own will, uh, what we ought should um, be doing in service and uh, to God. Um, I've done that. I'm sure you have at some point as well. Maybe even um, that's something that you're struggling with right now. I put in your um, PowerPoint um, some something that is a bit of a personal testimony of my own. Um, when I was a young adult, 
um, I became, um, what's the word? Not, not disenfranchised, but I was a little bit that too. But I, I became uh, resistant, turned off, um, all kinds of things regarding church, the local church. And um, I became what I call a church rejecter slash church defector. And there were some characteristics that I noticed that looking back um, that I noticed in myself that were very similar to the attitude being displayed by the people in Jesus' parable in Luke, uh, Luke 14 here and by those described in Hebrews chapter 3. Some of those were um, things like this. Um, when I went to church and heard a message or heard a testimony, heard anything, uh, everything that challenged or chafed me, in other words, anything that rubbed me the wrong way, I took as a personal attack rather than an opportunity for um, transformation. And secondly, I was constantly on the lookout for something to criticize, mainly so that I could justify my lack of participation or commitment. Um, I could walk into any church and immediately start to point out to you what was wrong with it, what was wrong with people there, the service there, the, I mean, you name it. I had been in church all my life and I just had a um, hundred, I could have written a book called 101 Reasons um, Not to Fool with Church, um, at least in a really deep um, or meaningful fashion. And I was wrong, but I thought I was right because um, I was deceived by my own heart. Now, thirdly, my response to any even remotely contrary opinion was to debate them and to defend myself. So debate and defend was my, was my mantra. Um, it wasn't um, listen and consider or listen and respond. It was debate and defend. Um, and that was indicative of my, um, well, my state of heart at that point in time. Uh, fourthly, I still wanted to serve God, but mainly because I knew I was supposed to and because it made me feel good about myself. And what would, I would serve God as long as I was in control of it or felt in control of it. And as long as there was something in it for me. It's just selfishness oozing from that reality. And then finally, I was the master of excuses. And trust me, whatever I chose to reject or to refuse to participate in was totally someone else's or something else's, primarily though, someone else's fault. Um, I was never the one to, uh, to blame for not doing what I was supposed to do in obedience to God. And thankfully though, <laughs> God is smarter and far more faithful than me. And he saw it fit to work around all of this foolishness and even through my foolishness to bless me to change and to bless me to serve in his kingdom and to draw me back to him. You see, while, and so, and so eventually I went from being a church rejecter uh, to being a church pastor. And that was not an easy bridge for me to cross. It was one that God had to enable and do some major transforming work, some major healing work, some major helping work, and um, help in helping me to um, humble myself and be reachable, be reachable. Um, my excuses and the resulting refusals were totally acceptable in my mind, though. Uh, however, they were not at all acceptable in God's mind, and, and neither are anybody else's, neither are yours. Um, I um, am not insinuating that you will be left out of uh, God's kingdom if you choose to reject participation in the local church like, like I did for a while. 
I am telling you that you will miss out on many opportunities to be part of the advancement of God's kingdom if you choose not to participate in the local body of believers as God would have you to. I know this from two reasons. One, from personal experience that I just mentioned to you. And trust me when I tell you that if you think you have reason enough to uh, refuse participation and um, alignment with and submission to God's church, um, the, the people there and the leadership there, um, the, the, the ministry there, then um, I guarantee you that I have uh, 10 times as many excuses that I could use and have used and um, that none of them are good enough for God. Only obedience is good enough for God. And so um, I have, there is some scripture that has been really important to me um, to help me remember that. One of the pa- those passages is from Hebrews chapter 10, verses 19 through 25. Now God's word says this, Therefore, brethren, having boldness to enter the holiest by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way, which he consecrated for us through the veil that is his flesh, and having a high priest over the house of God, let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering, for he who promised is faithful. And let us consider one another in order to stir up love and good works, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together, as is the manner of some, but exhorting one another, and so much the more as you see the day approaching. Here's an ironic thing. Uh, You may not see it as that big of a deal, but it was pretty uh, remarkable as I look back on it. During this time where I was having such a struggle, uh, um, a, a, a genuine wrestling match in my heart and mind about um, God's church, I was attending a Christian university where I was um, or deeply involved in worship and ministry and those things, but also still deeply suspect of the local church and um and very um distant in my involvement with it um and this is the ironic part i was going to tell you i took a class on the book of hebrews as an elective i was i was not a bible or religion major at the uh, um i was well that doesn't matter but but I took this class as an elective and I wrote a paper on this passage that I just read to you about the importance of, um, for instance, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together. In other words, as is the manner of some, in other words, um, the importance of going to church and being part of the body there um, and doing so in order to stir up love and good works and to encourage one another all the more so as we see what's going on in the world around us and i was reading those things i was studying this i was writing a paper you know um emphatically promoting and exegeting and uh um you know exposing these truths and proclaiming them and at the same time still you know being resistant about them a little uh, to a degree in my heart and i know that's a challenge for for all of us because um you know because churches is made up of people and people are sinners and we um we let each other down and all those things and that's a reality about anything you do uh, with people anywhere but it's not an excuse for not obeying God it's not an excuse for not going to church 
it's not an excuse for not being part of his the, the ministry uh, in your church. It's not an excuse for not being uh, in fellowship with the people at your church in order to encourage them um, when you have the opportunity to. And um, I was furthermore challenged by uh, Romans chapter 12, uh, where it tells us this, starting with verse 3. For I say through the grace given to me, to everyone who is among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think soberly, as God has dealt to each one a measure of faith. So there we are again talking about um, humility. Um, uh, and then it goes on to talk about the church. In verse 4. For as we have many members in one body, but all the members do not have the same function, so we, being many, are one body in Christ, and individually members of one another. I'm going to read that one more time. For as we have many members in one body, but all the members do not have the same function, so we, being many, are one body in Christ and individually members of one another. So so we, being many, are one body in Christ and individually members of one another. We're not, with, without one another, we are, um, well, let me, let me say it in the positive. We, being many, are one body in Christ. We have different functions and we work best uh, together um, to do those functions. And um, it goes on in verse 6 to explain what that looks like. Having then gifts differing according to the grace that is given to us, let us use them. In prophecy, let us prophesy in proportion to our faith. Or ministry, let, it, let us use it in our ministry. He who teaches in teaching. He who exhorts in exhortation. He who gives with liberality. He who leads with diligence. He who shows mercy with cheerfulness. And all these things are speaking to us as believers this morning, to you as a believer, to you as someone who may or may not be um, uh, participating or active in a, in a local church, reminding us that um, that is the way, the primary way in which God has chosen to advance his kingdom in this world and to um, grow his kingdom right now, which is a kingdom of souls that know him and that, that worship him um, and serve him together. And this is a, a fact that is, that is undeniable that he wants you to be a part of that and he wants you to um, obey the things that he has commanded his church to do by you being a part of that and another fact is is that there are no acceptable excuses uh, for not being a part of that i am um, the key witness in that case because i tried them all i have tried them all still do sometimes still do and um, god has proven to me that um, my excuses are no match for um his power, his faithfulness, his and his will, and those are the things that you need to be reached by this morning, the, and the things that you need to be reachable about. And we are running running along, I know, on time. So the second part, uh, the second thing that we need to do. Um, Um, to joyfully prepare for, per, joyfully be part of the kingdom of God. The first is to be reachable. The second is to be reaching. And so that, here here we are, in fact, crossing that bridge from being uh, who God wants us to be. Um, humble, uh, surrendered, submissive, reachable. To being who God, to doing what God wants us to do, reaching others. And so in verses 
in Luke uh, 14, verses 21 through 24, Jesus says this. <clears throat> After the, all the excuses were given, it says, So that servant came and reported these things to his master. Then the master of the house, being angry, said to his servant, Go out quickly into the streets and the lanes of the city, and bring in here the poor and the maimed and the lame and the blind. And the servant said, Master, it is done as you commanded, and still there is room. Then the master said to the servant, Go out into the highways and hedges, and compel them to come in, that my house may be filled. For I say to you that none of those men who are invited shall taste my supper. We'll talk more about this next week because we're this is the second installment of our Intend to Depend and Descend uh, message. Next week we're going to move to Intend to Depend and Ascend. Um, and we'll go further into this passage and into the next. And um, we want to see, again, the, how we cross this bridge from being reachable uh, to be those who are reaching. Um, and um, I have uh, more uh, to share with you about that, but uh, I think I will um, save it for next week. And just ask you this morning, um, are you ready to um, cross that bridge from who God wants you to be and what he wants you to do? Again, what he wants you, to, who he wants you to be, is humble and submissive, not wise in your own opinion, but dependent upon him completely. And he wants you to, be, because of that, be surrendered and obedient to what he wants you to do as part of his church and for his kingdom. Are you ready to cross that bridge this morning? I, I believe that you that you are or that you're going to be because of what God's doing in you through the truth that you heard today. And I'm praying that we all will get over our um, excuses um, that we will do as um, some teenagers I used to know say we'll build a bridge and get over them. And in fact, we'll cross the bridge that God has laid out for us so that we can get to where he wants us to be for his glory. Let me pray for you. Lord, we thank you for the truth that you have given us this morning. And I pray that it would ring true in our hearts and that by your spirit, you would use it to transform our minds and our attitudes and what we see is um or how we are seeing things and i know that um we uh, have our excuses and um but i'm thankful that you have your um power and sovereignty and will and faithfulness and your grace and abundance to help us and please help us by it i pray that we may be able to um overcome by your power um, that you may pull us out of our excuses and our selfishness and, and, and the deceit that so easily um, confuses us and help us to cross the bridge to advancing your kingdom um, together as your church and as your people and we ask that in Jesus name for your glory amen not sure when you get to watch this, but when you do, I want you to know that um, I, I am praying for you and I hope that you and your family are safe and warm and we'll be talking to you uh, later this week, okay? I'll send out an um, email early in the week, let you know what's going on uh, with Bible study and things like that. Hopefully we'll be back um, uh, to normal for the week, but we, we will see what the weather does. Until then, God bless you all. Um, we all love you, and um, we will uh, talk to you soon. Take care. Bye-bye.